Hi, Geek. Hey, Bob. How you doing? Uh, I'm doing fine. I hope you're happy that Al Gore didn't take himself out of the presidential race yet. I didn't realize that he hadn't. I mean, was, I didn't realize he had an opportunity to. And well, he was in Australia promoting his movie, and they said, "Have you ruled out a presidential run?" And he said, "No, it's too early." No, uh, I think so. Of course, he's promoting his movie, so it kills his movie if he says, "I'm not running for president." You're, you're being too cynical. He's not that kind of man, Mickey. Uh, you've had the up close and personal contact with him. I haven't. So. Yeah, we're like, we're like this. Okay, well, um, well so, so I wanted to cheer you up. Yeah, I'm feeling a lot better you already. How little, are things in California out there? You seem a little downbeat in the in the, in the green room. Uh, uh, things are fine. Great. Uh, the energy levels are low, as usual, but, but, but they just speed it up now. Yeah, I know. Uh, the, the, That's our we, secret. No, uh, uh, Mickey. I thought we had to disclose. No, we do oh. disclose. It's, it's at the bottom of the site in the fine print. In fact... If they look at their Windows Media Player, they'll see that it's set for 1.1 by default, and then they can reset it right. if, they, if, if, they, if they want us at the normal speed. But if you put us up to 1.5, we sound much, much smarter. No, that, well, we sound kind of crazy at that speed. It's, uh, but it's, I am personally uh, a little exhausted. I uh, today went through the semi-annual ritual of paying rotor rooters several hundred dollars to clear the pipe that leads to the sewage, you know? Hey, we did that too today. You're kidding. No. It's <laughs> Rotor Rooter Day. It's You're serious? Alive. That's bizarre. You know, there's another way this links up with you, which is that this guy, this Rotor Rooter guy, he's down in the basement, you know, hovering over a pit of, like, liquefied human excrement. And I was, like, wondering, what did he get paid for this? And I'm thinking, probably not much. And I thought for a second, maybe I should tell him that, don't worry, my friend Mickey Cow says income inequality is not the problem. It's just social inequality, and we'll, we'll, we'll solve that, and then you'll be okay. Um, but then I, I decided really not to bring up the subject at all. So I, I, who knows how he would have reacted, but. Good. Um. Well, as, as you know, today's 9-11. It which is. is a it's, bad, a, it's a fifth anniversary. Which is a bad day for Cal's files because it means that everybody dredges up the thing I wrote on 9-12, which is that the whole, it will be off the front pages by Thanksgiving. <laughs> not, not my finest hour. but um, No. Of course, uh, how did you know that we were going to get a president who did all he could to turn it into a... Well, I wrote it on 9-12 when I didn't even, we didn't even know what I could did it or, you know, that it came from Afghanistan, et cetera, et cetera. You thought maybe um, it was just a prank? No, well, although no, we knew we sort of knew it was Al Qaeda, but that that would co have caused normal bloggers to refrain from predicting, of course, because they didn't know. But not you. Such is not the way of the blogosphere. Um, anyway, so so but but we're gonna like so we're gonna say something about nine eleven, but not inflict it on our viewers right away. Is that yeah? Because I think half the viewers, if we're at the slave meeting, half the people were completely sick of nine eleven stories, and the other half were just getting into them. So that. that, that that led the me second to think, reaction does strike me as strange. That but, led me to think, well, I haven't read anything. I've been ignoring it. No, I know. That's how such an awesome. I've read yeah, virtually well, nothing. Oh, but so now you can like go in and pick out, pick off the meat off the bones, you know? Uh, anyway, let's talk about something else first. Let's talk about brain death. What do you say? Well, brain death, we're approaching brain death, so I think... Uh, let's quit illustrating it and analyze <laughs> it. Well, th there was this v very interesting experiment that a guy in Britain did where somebody who had been pronounced by medical authorities in a persistent vegetative state, just like Terry Schiavo. I don't know that it was persistent, actually. That, okay, I, don't, I don't know that they'd been vegetative long enough to be called that. It was a, it was a couple months, I believe. Yeah. Are you sure okay. they were labeled? Anyway, no, there was a distinction. I, we don't between, know that they were persistent. Right. Correct. They were in a vegetative right. state. And he asked her to imagine, what, running through a field, playing tennis, and walking through her house. Mm -hmm. There's a woman who had been in a car accident. Uh, and... The same parts of her brain lit up as light up in ordinary, normally conscious people who uh, imagined themselves walking through their house and playing tennis, uh, which led the doctor to conclude that there was no other explanation other than that, that she was intentionally willing these thoughts in her head and that, and that therefore she had some uh, consciousness. And there's actually a dispute about that, which seems to me a very interesting dispute. Yeah, uh, I think that doctor's wrong to make that inference. We should say, before elaborating, that I think you are one of these people who lives in morbid fear of having the plug pulled on you prematurely someday. No, I, li well, uh, I, I, live, in, I live in fear of the uh, disingenuous machinery of death that we have constructed uh, to, through various legal fictions. Somebody's going to go to court and say, Mickey would rather have had the plug pulled. And it seems to me... Uh, 
you know that, that, that this machinery is 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 something that to be fought against, uh, and that's what the Terry Shriver case was all about. So, in, in some, opinion. you live in morbid fear of having to put blood prematurely pulled on you someday. I think I just live in morbid fear. Okay. Of anyway, all sorts you of are one of these people for whom that's an issue. So there, there are high I'm stakes against, here. I'm, I tend to be against pulling the plug. Yeah. Whereas my feeling is, you know, say la vie or whatever. Um, but but the the uh, first of all, let me tell you why I think that doctor is premature. Um, you know, these split brain experiments that you may or may not have studied in college, people who have had the corpus callosum that connects the two hemispheres of their brain severed. Right. They can do these experiments. So, in effect, their hemispheres are kind of acting independently. Right. So they can do these experiments by, like, they, they divide their eyes and their ears so they can feed information into just one hemisphere and not the other. Right. And, like, they'll tell these people in one hemisphere, not the one that controls language, uh, they'll feed the information, get up and walk toward the door. People get up and walk toward the door. No doubt the, the part of their brain that corresponds to motor activity would be lighting up if you studied it. They ask them as they're walking to, through the door, why are you walking toward the door? And they say something like, well, I was thirsty and I wanted to go get some water. They make something up because they are not consciously aware of the actual reason they're getting up and walking to the door. Right. So that's a case where either the severing of this corpus callosum actually creates two separate conscious beings within your brain, okay, right. uh, and, w and only one of them is accessible to us via language, only one of them can report to us, or this doctor is wrong to make the inference that just because the motor activity is, is part of the brain is lighting up, that means you're responding to commands volitionally, okay? But, so, 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 I think you, so, so the fact that all these motor things uh, light up is not enough for consciousness for Bob Reif, so what is enough? Well, the, is the, the whole distinctive feature of consciousness is that you can, you can actually, strictly speaking, never verify its existence in other people because, strictly speaking, even when people tell you they're conscious, you don't know that for sure. We can make machines that say they're conscious, you know, and may, who knows, maybe they are. But, I mean, consciousness is this completely, that's why it's so resistant to scientific inquiry, to really sound scientific well, inquiry, is, is you can never, it's never publicly observable the way all other phenomena we're aware of are. So consciousness is not your criteria for whether or not something is alive or dead? No, or consciousness is the big moral litmus test. It's just that figuring out whether something's conscious is very, very hard. And certainly the brain firing, to me, is not, is not an indication that something's necessarily conscious. Well, certainly... I just gave you this experiment in which it's verified. That yeah, that... but then you say that it can't verify it in any case, so that you, your argument proves too much. I mean, there's nothing well, that can verify. Well, all I'm saying for now is that this doctor, it's an unwarranted inference. That's the only argument I'm making now, and everything I just said is consistent with that argument and conducive to it, I think. I mean, uh, but, but you're right. I mean, I might, say, I might say strictly speaking in any case that a doctor is unwarranted in inferring that anything is conscious, but I'm saying in this case there's very good reason to think he's kind of jumping the gun. But it's hard to see what experiment would prove she was conscious without requiring her to talk and say, hey, I'm conscious. That's true. So this is, as, is elusive. this is sort of as good as you're going to get. Well, no, it may be that we, that we uh, acquire subtler ways to look at the, the motor activity of the brain. Like, for example, compare the brains of these split brain patients to, you know, uh, to, to, to the brains of people like you and me when we hear the command to go walk, okay? So you could... It well, that's what he did. No, no, wait, 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 that's exactly what he did. He compared it to the brains of ordinary people who, who imagine themselves walking through a house or playing tennis. No, no, but I'm saying that the thing he found common to this patient and, and normal people would probably be common to the split brain patients in us. I'm saying further study of the split brain patients in us could unearth patterns of acti brain activity that are distinctive to us, who we know are conscious, of receiving the command, and uh, anyway, believe well, you, me, I think I'm saying it makes sense. Well, but, you would think, that, but there has to be some some parts of the brain are going to light up among the people who are conscious and talking about it. Right, uh, that and don't it light the, up in the people who don't, aren't talking. It about may it, be obviously. that we haven't found those parts of the brain yet. But but there obviously is going to be some of them because the one some people are talking and the other people aren't. So the the, the point is that. Uh, this this person had a whole lot more going on in her brain than uh, than she definitely had at least somewhat more going on than you would have assumed. It's it's definitely not a, a sound foundation for concluding with great confidence that she's conscious. Um, I mean, another interesting case is dreams. A kind of a kind of where if you wake somebody up in the middle of the dream, 
they, they seem to have been having a conscious experience because they remember it. But if you wait, you know, several minutes after the dream or certainly an hour, they have no memory of it. Well, so, so it's very, that, even that is different from normal everyday consciousness because we remember things an hour after they happen. So there's yeah, that kind of have, intermediate category of consciousness. You have to have memory to have consciousness I'm too? I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that we yeah. can distinguish between the kinds of consciousness that seem to involve memory and be part of a continuous sense of identity and those like dreams that don't seem to be. You know, one great thing about this discussion is that if anyone suspected we were conscious of ratings and trying to, like, keep oh. people... No, this is riveting. What are you talking oh, about? Okay, sorry. I this underestimated from, their audience. This is ripped from the day's headlines, and at 1.1 speed, it'll be fantastic. But, <laughs> I, I, the, I mean, one of your, your mind-brain points is that consciousness is sort of a miracle because you could have these robots who aren't really conscious who do all the things we do and survive in a Darwinian sense, and yet... I, I have made this argument. Yet we have consciousness. So it sounds like that this woman, sort of behind her, her you know, facade of being, uh, you know, knocked out and in a vegetative state, was that robot, sort of. Exactly, kind of. That's kind of what I'm saying, yes. And if, and if she's at, but what is the practical limitation, so we, that we can pull the plug on her? Well, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I, I mean, that's the trouble. You have to be kind of agnostic. I'm just saying this, this isn't overwhelming evidence of consciousness. That's my very limited point, and we've done an experiment that proves that, it, that, that this kind of thing is not... I, I mean, think we've proven it, if, you, if, but, if, if I remember right, that experiment. But the, but, the, but the larger point is that in the Shivo case, all these self-righteous uh, people, ACLU types, were saying, see, see, science is right. When they say vegetative state, they mean vegetative state. We shouldn't question scientists. And then it turns out that scientists don't really know when they discover I, new I things. I agree that their and, side of the argument has been strengthened to some extent. Okay, well... It has not nearly become ironclad. But anyway, I have a question for you. Okay. As you being someone who has a morbid fear of having the plug pulled prematurely, in my That's view. That's not high on my list of morbid fears. <laughs> well, but, but then again, it's a long list. Um, why are you not equally afraid of the situation being that, yes, you're in there unconscious, but it's a miserable existence, and you would love to have the plug pulled? That seems to me uh, a scarier thought than death itself. I mean, if there was a 50-50 chance, either A, I'm in there and not having a bad time, or B, I'm in there having a horrible time. If I knew that the chances were 50-50 and you, you told me, what do you want done? I'd say, pull the plug. Well, that, 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 uh, maybe I just lack the imagination to, uh, to, to come up with that example. And also, uh, th th isn't there also the complicating issue of brain time? This is what, this is what my friend uh, uh, Rob, why he says we shouldn't pull the plug on Shivo, because... Uh, a second in brain time could seem like an eternity. So the argument that I would make, which is that, well, even though I'm having a bad time, it's probably not going to last very long, wouldn't apply because even if it, la if it lasts five years, it might seem like 500 years in brain time. This sounds like a really weird argument your friend has. Any, well, he's a, he's a um, comedy writer for Cheers. So. Well. <laughs> but uh, I thought it was an interesting argument. Anyway, um, uh, yeah. Oh, maybe I should worry about that, but it also seems to me that you're straining to come up with arguments for Does pulling the plug. Does he know? I mean, maybe he has a time war problem himself. Does he know that Cheers has gone off the air? Yes, he's acutely he aware of that. So he's more or less, okay, so he's more or less in tune with real time. That's good. Yes. Um, but, um, uh, anyway, it, 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 it the anti shivo the anti, uh, the pro-husband people, the pro-husband people's position has been somewhat weakened. Right. I agree, but not... not and it was weak to begin with. But the battle's not over. Oh, I'm not sure about that. The well, other thing is, wait a second. Here's another question. Isn't it? Isn't your morbid aversion having plug pulled prematurely kind of like a selfish thing? I mean, so, okay, you're sitting there not having a terrible time, but, like, we're pumping tons of money into keeping you, like, in that state when we could be saving children in Africa. You're not doing anything that gratifies your loved ones or anything. You're not contributing anything to the, to the world. You're, you're just like a black hole for money. Well, Isn't it kind of selfish to it, want to live it, under it, those it circumstances? Is selfish, Whereas now we're enriching people's lives because we're doing blogging heads. Well, but, you know, if you follow your argument, you, you, you wind up with... Uh killing a whole bunch of people and sending the money to Africa. Maybe that'll be But the not us, because we're doing blogging heads. Maybe that'll be the conclusion of your course with Peter Singer. But it does seem to me that, uh, don't you argue that paramecium have enough consciousness that we should be aware of it? If you had a whole planet full of paramecium, that maybe that would add up to one human being. So if you have a, a, a patient in a, vet, in, a, you know, in, in a coma and all these things are firing in her brain, that's worth at least a couple of paramecium, isn't it? I'd say seven, seven to ten. Okay, well, I'm glad that you've uh, 
you settle that. Yeah. I've never actually quite made the argument you just described. I think you made that say seven to ten is my. I thought you made that in an argument in the New Republic. Maybe that was in my Cal of Youth or something. I don't know. Okay. Well, Jesus. Okay. I consider that a victory. That I. I don't know. I don't know that I did. You're probably misremembering. But if I did. I would not have put it quite like that. There was a qualitative dimension to sentience. I mean, yeah, paramecium may be sentient. Bacteria may, may well be sentient to some extent. But it's not a merely quantitative thing where a million of them equals one of us. There, there are qualitative. A million of them would not have language and self-reflection, for example. Um, and a good thing, too. Okay. <laughs> You're right. Uh, Boy, how much time did we eat up with that one? Well, at 1.1, you know, says 16 means 14 and a half, Okay. I thought that was exciting. It'll go by very quickly. <laughs> um, uh, now, we're, now, we're going to get into calcism? Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I, as long as I'm self-reflective and can use the language for the lingering few minutes where that's possible, uh, I've noticed on my blog that I am taking increasingly gl increasing glee, and I admit it, at the prospect that after all this, the Democrats might not take back the House. Uh, and, you, you, you know, you can sort of see it bubbling up. I see it bubbling up in my keyboard when I write posts about how, uh, you know, if you really look at the race-by-race -race analysis that uh, the, the Democrats aren't, isn't, the, the cake isn't baked, the, the, it's not done. Uh, the De Republicans could come back. They're, the New York Times story about how they might lose, not win the seats in New York that they thought they were going to win. There was another article about how they might actually lose some seats in Georgia. Um, and, and I find myself relishing this prospect, and I admit it, and, and, and we, there's a name for that, which... Unfortunately, is calcism. It should be really called Cadellism because Pat Cadell has this disease much worse than I do. That's really uh, modest of you, but uh, uh, but uh, but um, and, and I want to justify it. First, uh, what would happen if the Democrats uh, took over the House? Well, we get a really horrible immigration bill that would probably change. We, we'd have a good chance of getting a horrible Senate-like immigration bill that would change the nature of our country forever and further worse. Uh, that's not a good thing, uh, and. Um, Nothing good would happen of it. It's not like we're going to get national health care if Nancy Pelosi is speaker with a Republican Senate and Bush is president. So it's not like they're counterbalancing achievements that are going to happen. We're just going to get a lot of uh, hearings and obstruction and negotiations. Uh, second, there'll be a huge... Uh, if the, it, what happens if, if the Democrats lose? Well, there'll be a huge bloodbath in the Democratic Party. People will be really frustrated and pissed off. And the forces of calcism will prevail. No, but th it'll be productive. People, a, a, Which it, means, in your view, the forces of calcism will no, prevail. No, there might be a split. There might be a split in the center of the Democratic Party might sort of take on a more coherent identity, free of the net roots and the interest groups, and maybe make a, a, an alliance with uh, similar forces in the Republican Party. That uh, might be yielding good. an ideology remarkably like yours. Well, if I gave you Chuck Hagel as head of that party, you'd probably go for it, right? On grounds of foreign policy, I would. Yeah, well, there you go. Uh, McCain is the obvious person to, to head that tendency, but... Can but I say just one word about baggage. McCain? Can I just baggage. do a footnote? Yeah. Let's all remember that uh, bef before the election of 2000, he was the neocons man, okay? So the people who, who, who brought us the Iraq War via George Bush, the guy, was, that, the guy that they were pretty confident would see the world their way and do the things they wanted to do was John McCain. And everything he's done since then is consistent with that profile. So uh, He was the weekly standard neocons man. He was the Brooks Crystal man. I don't know if he was like Charles Krauthammer's man. Well, I don't know that Charles is really a true neocon in a, in a way. But, um, well, I, doubt he, I don't know that he was Paul Wolfowitz's man. I don't know that he was Richard Pearl's man. Well, the man. voice of the neocons is you know, was, Bill, the weekly standard. I mean, he, was the, he, was the voice, he was the man of the national greatness conservatives who tend to be neocons. Anyway, I just want crystal. to briefly drag his name through the mud. You can go okay. ahead now. Anyway, um, uh, so there'll be a bloodbath if the Democrats lose, and there'll be also the Democrats will finally stand up against gerrymandering, because that's what will have cost them the election. Uh, you know, when, when, when Schwarzenegger proposed his anti-gerrymandering thing in California, Nancy Pelosi raised funds against it. Gee, if she doesn't become Speaker because, uh, you know, she didn't get the five seats that a fair redistricting would have given the Democrats, She's going to look pretty stupid, and she's going to pay the price for being a, a, a mindless party hack. Uh, and if the Democrats lose, there'll be a huge media uh, campaign against gerrymandering, which will be all to the good. So, and it'll all, sure. and, and if they win, it'll validate a bunch of bogus, uh, you know, net roots memes. Like the, if we're vicious and partisan enough, that, that that's enough for victory. Two things. That's my argument. Okay. First of all, can I say that, of course, the allegation against you is that although you claim to be a liberal, claim to be a Democrat, in your heart you're really not. Okay. Now, 
Can I just suggest that what you've d just done, which is to say that when I envision the policy consequences of the Democrats winning, I find them abhorrent. Th that no, is evidence that you're actually not a Democrat. No, because they're, they're not going to achieve any of the good Democratic goals. Maybe well, no, you said the immigration bill. Minimum. Didn't you say the immigration bill they would pass? You would not like. Well, I disagree with that well, part. Well, that's of... my point. That's their policy, though, Mickey. That's well, what that's... you're envisioning their policies taking effect and saying, "I don't like that." Well, well if, if you do that meant... often enough, it means you don't support the right. party. Right. Right. But I don't do that all the time. If, if that's all no, it meant to be a Democrat. just around election time. If that's all it meant to be a Democrat, then I wouldn't be a Democrat. But they're good Democrats, uh, like. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, Mickey, we're waiting. Byron Dorgan, <laughs> yeah. like Byron Dorgan, who opposed immigration reform because of its effect on low-wage workers. Uh, there are a lot of people in the labor union, labor movement who have qualms about it. Uh, it's 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 only because uh, you know Democrats happen to fall on, under the sway of uh, Latino lobbies and also under the the the, the temptation that oh we're going to get the Latino vote forever and ever uh, that, that that they've gone hard for the uh, McCain Kennedy approach. Uh, yeah, well, but anyway, that's all the Democrats were, were, were that I would be a Democrat. The other thing is, it seems to me, if you were really a true blue liberal Democrat, you would not just be saying what will be the effect over the next two years. You would be saying, and maybe you have said this and done this thought experiment, what would be most conducive to taking the trifecta two years from now, the presidency in both, in both houses? And I think, actually, just winning the House, maybe just what the doctor ordered there, I, I, I think it might be bad to get both the House and the Senate, because then you're at least as responsible as the party in the White House, you know, and if things are kind of still going not great, then you're held responsible and you can't be insurgents. Uh, but if, if, if you just got the House, not the Senate, not the White House, then you're not mainly responsible for things, A, and B, you do have enough power to hold the occasional hearing that might embarrass the President. You don't want to overdo it. But well, it's, it's, it's weird, because you can make that argument both ways. There are Republicans who say, gee, it's in our interest to just lose the House but not the Senate, because then the Democrats have enough power just to make themselves really unpopular and to make fools of themselves, but they don't have enough power to obstruct us. There are all sorts of games and, and you know, ways you can say, well, it's in our interest to lose. Usually those are wrong. I agree that if I, – I tend to think that if I, all I cared about were the Democrats winning the presidency in 2008 – that uh, probably I would want the Democrats, probably the Democrats should want to retake the House. Okay. Uh, but, but, so uh, you're but not terribly because, attached to the goal of the only Democrats because taking the, the White House in two years from now, and you don't want them to take the House this year, and yet you consider yourself a Democrat in good standing. I, 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 that's on a black box I don't know about. I'm willing to potentially compromise it in order to, uh, in order to stave off this horrible immigration reform. Look, I've been gleeful at the Republicans taking the House for, for the previous 10 years, because I thought if the Democrats took it, they would screw up welfare reform. I agree that that's now over. But, but now the, the threat is that they'll actually pass a horrible immigration bill. That's, you know, what, what are you in politics for to achieve results? Here's a really bad result that will happen if the Democrats take the House. So uh, how, consistent, can, how can I not let that affect So your thinking? consistent position over more than a decade is wanting Democrats to lose. Correct. In the House, yes. <laughs> and yet, and yet, but not you are president. offended by suggestions that you're not a loyal Democrat. Mickey, I really don't think you. I, I don't think you've well, come the, out ahead. The, the array of divided government with a Democrat in the White House and the Republicans who control the House actually served the country pretty well, didn't it? So, what did uh, you say? I, I'm sorry, Mister. The, the array. I definitely want a Democrat to win the presidency. The, the the question is, do you want the Democrats to control all three branches, or do you want a divided government with the Republicans controlling the purse strings and the Democrat in the White House? which is what we had during most of Clinton's administration, and which served the country very well and is the uh, array that leads to low spending and low deficits. Uh, it, and that's an interesting question. Okay. Well, we spent enough time on that that anyway, I really okay. don't have time to get into the I thought you would be more of vicious, I'm sorry. What's that? I thought you would be more vicious. You well, were... it seemed to me you were doing such a good job of, of humiliating okay. yourself that I didn't really need to step in, but oh, maybe, thank you. maybe okay. I'm wrong. Okay, there you go. Um, I, I, I've kept some, some of my weapons in reserve for next time. God, okay, well, I led to, I'll add to my list of morbid fears. It's morbid fears that you will deploy your weapon. No, your most morbid fear is sitting there and then not having pulled the plug and me doing this show without you and, and continuing to talk about calcism. While, way, I, while, I'm, while, I'm on, while the camera's still fixed on me. <laughs> that would be great we've, TV. We've already approached that stage in several <laughs> of our dialogues. That would be great TV. Uh,
And you know, Mickey, just a question. I mean, if you ever are in that state, I mean, God forbid, God forbid, but if you ever are in a permanent vegetative state, you know, given the fact that you and I have discussed this and I'm pretty familiar with your views, is it okay if I just kind of have power of attorney and make the decision? Uh, I don't think so. Because, you know, I mean, one thing one thing doing this Blogging Heads TV thing has done for me is it's made me very decisive, you know. Just got to take what input you have, make your decision, don't look back. There's a list of people I, I that that I'm drawing up who, who I'll, my living will will refuse admission to my hospital room. <laughs> and at the top of it is Dr. Sherwin Newland. But, uh, but you'll be a close second. Okay. <laughs> no, it's your call. It's um, your consciousness, man. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. No problem. I love you, man. Um, so now we're moving on to the topic we should have probably started the show with. 9-11? Uh, 9-11. Yeah. Now what, what, uh, now, what I suggested in an email is we, we both think of something that we've learned since 9-11 about the whole kind of phenomenon of terrorism or something. Did you yeah. get that email? Yes, I did. You uh, have I, something? I have, so, I have a couple things. Uh, uh, first, the stupidity of al-Qaeda, at least, when they could bring America to its, uh, you know, don't watch this, please, Osama. But He's not watching. Uh, they could bring America to its knees through a series of uh, random small bore bombings of shopping centers in you know remote parts of the country. Uh, and the way our media works, the country would just be paralyzed, and at least for a long time, uh, it would be like the Washington sniper. You know, I mean, paralyzing all of Washington with a few random killings every now and then. But yeah, the striking thing about that uh, is just two people. They didn't. They were ultimately kind of so uh, incautious that they got caught, but they didn't have to. They didn't have to die. They totally terrorized the city. And imagine, like, you know, five of five of such teams. But but And planting a few bombs? I mean, it, it, it's... No, it's true. You can do a lot without having any suicide bombers at your disposal. And, w the, I mean, part of the, the, the standard answer for why they haven't done anything like that is, I mean, I'd like to think it's because, A, they can't get anybody into the country, and, B, nobody who's already in the country wants to do it. I'd like to think that's... That's it. I mean, the alternative explanation is that the, the next thing they do has to outdo 9-11, right? That, that they have too much pride to do something small bore. Well, yeah, but that, but that's, that was what I learned. And it, it, also learning that there, there, there are fewer of these guys out there than, than I feared it five years ago. Yeah. Uh, which, which feeds into your argument about how if we lower the amount of hatred in the world, we might really reduce that number meaningfully since it's close to being not a critical mass. Anyway, that, so that's one thing I learned. I have some other things, but... Okay. Uh, should I say something? That, yeah, I think it's your I turn. mean, actually, uh, you know, I, I went back and read uh, this epic piece I did for Slate. It was a 10-part series adding up to, like, 20,000 words exactly one year after 9-11, so right. four years ago. Right. And... It was eerily prescient, you decided. <laughs> well, I've got to say... I mean, I don't think I'm that bad about self-promotion, but I think it holds up pretty well. We'll link to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. I would, I would like just like to read one paragraph in particular before I get it, get 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 onto the things I was wrong about. Uh, what I said four years ago was, if we follow this course, the self-fulfilling prophecy will work like this: as we declare war on various Islamic groups that are only marginally concerned with America, these groups will grow more opposed to America and more united in that opposition until we indeed have something like a war of civilizations on our hands. Now, actually, the, the kind of the details of how that would play out, I don't think I was especially right about. But the basic idea that we would be undiscriminating in who we deem the threatening terrorists to be and so on, it would wind up one way or another knitting a lot of groups together in opposition to us, I think has kind of happened. I mean, Zarqawi is an example of somebody who, before 9-11, had directed most of his animus toward the Jordanian government, and then once we started the Iraq War, blah, blah, blah. Uh, extremists in Palestine are much more opposed to America than they were five or six years ago. Uh, so too with Hezbollah after Lebanon. And then <clears throat> the other thing that, uh, and I don't know that I did highlight this sufficiently, <clears throat> but, but when you get things, high visibility, uh, things like the Iraq War or, or the bombing in Lebanon, modern communications are so good at getting the, the images out to Muslims everywhere uh, that, that it has a, a unifying effect, at least among the discontented, the more discontented of the Muslims, all the way around the world. And there was a good piece in the Wall Street Journal that I'll link to on Friday, and it says, to Western security officials, the most troubling element is what they call growing militancy among some Muslim populations far removed from the Middle East. Jihadist websites and <clears throat> Arab media have seized on the bloodshed in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Lebanon to export images that help radicalize Muslims in Europe and Southeast Asia, so on. So, 
Clash of Civilizations is a self-fulfilling prophecy. I would say I kind of got right. Uh, and and I would, well, I guess I should stop. So I, what you learned since 9-11 is that you were right, at, right <laughs> from the beginning. Yeah, I was wrong to think that I wasn't as right as I've turned out to be. <laughs> I, my, my self-esteem was too low back then, Mickey. Um, no, That's but pathetic. I, I mean, like you, I overestimated the contagion I was describing. I mean, you said you thought there were more of them out there. I, I think I exaggerated the degree. I mean, I think I was, I was right to describe it as fundamentally a problem of contagion of ideas and of attitude and say that the administration was wrong to view it in such a centralized way and think, well, okay, we get rid of al-Qaeda, then we get rid of states that sponsor terrorist groups, and then you're done. And I, I think I was right to emphasize that you've got to worry about the, the, the you know, meme contagion that may ensue depending on how you approach those goals. But I, I, well, like lots of people, I certainly thought we would have gotten hit again in five years. And definitely, if you had described to me the, the screw-ups that the administration has perpetrated, I definitely would say that we would have been hit. And, and I was wrong. Um, J Jake Weisberg had, kind of, had a pretty good piece, I think, addressing the question why we haven't been hit uh, in the last five years. But... Although it, 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 said, it, it, it admitted that uh, the things we've done to stop ourselves from being hit over the, this five years might cause us to be hit harder in the future. Yeah, I mean, he like didn't dwell on the point, but the upshot yeah. of his piece is that it may well be that, in the long run, the things that have kept us safe from terrorism have been self-defeating, that the Bush administration has been overzealous on a couple of fronts. Yeah, yeah. but it's a, good, it's a good solid piece. I, I must admit, I'm <laughs> and I, I may get in hot water here. Uh, I'm surprised at the extent to which the U.S. has allowed itself to become joined at the hip with Israel. Uh, it, it, you know, after 9/11, it looked there was a tremendous sort of uh, insecurity on the part of the American defenders of Israel because they were thinking, "Uh-oh, uh, people might think that the state of Israel is is getting the United States in trouble, and the United States now has a uh, has an interest in getting the Israelis to do things that previously it didn't have an interest in doing, like settling." <laughs> the West Bank dispute, uh, and uh, so the so the the, the, uh, the the sort of conservative Israel defenders propagated this meme of how we're all fighting the same enemy, we're all fighting terrorists. This was Sharon's point, and Norman Pretorius had an article, and I thought they'll never get away with this. This is too much, too strained an interpretation. Uh, but here, five years later, uh, I would say that they've won. That that is well, now the official. Uh, Bush administration position, and it's not getting a whole lot of opposition uh, in the United States. Well, yeah, I mean, I think Israel's view, leave, leave aside American supporters of Israel, Israel's view is it's Israel against the Muslim world or certainly the Arab world, okay? And it, it may be that there are ways in which that view is exaggerated. On the other hand, it wouldn't be hard to kind of substantiate it on an anecdotal basis, and in any event, you know, anybody kind of living in that country would, would probably tend to view the world that way. So from their point of view... Getting America in on their side is just, you know, it's all good. I mean, it's either you against the Muslim and or Arab world or you in America against the Muslim and or Arab world. Well, it's not all good because it means Israel then takes ownership of the Iraq war, which it probably well, doesn't I'm, want I'm to I'm talking do. about, like, back at the beginning of 9-11. Yeah, okay. and, and certainly it was Sharon's view. I mean, if you remember, Sharon, right after 9-11, rushed in with some very militant, aggressive action, e either in the, the West Bank or in Gaza in particular, and at that point, the Bush administration kind of said, hold off. I mean, Sharon's assumption was, after 9-11, now you understand. Now you understand that radical Islam is this monolithic threat against right. us all. And, and at that point, Bush actually kind of uh, gave, gave him a stop sign, one of the few he's given him. Well, um, yeah, there, there have been many periods. There was a period after where we seemed to be winning in Iraq when he got very tough with Sharon. The point is that he's now abandoned that. Well, right. Well, that's because the, he had promised that part of the Iraq, Iraq would be the road to peace in Jerusalem. And uh, so he wanted to make good on that once he got into the Iraq right. War. But you're right. Although Israel may feel as if uh, it was restrained by us in Lebanon, I mean, Bush gave him a good, a good month, and I think pretty much everyone agrees that that month didn't do America's image in the Muslim world uh, any good, and it didn't do Israel any good. And of course, that's, that's my line, is that, is that the truth is, you know, I mean, Israel's and America's interests are intertwined. They both lie in solving the Palestinian problem very, very soon because things are going to get much worse. Um, but uh, uh, at the same time, I think, I think the Lebanon thing has generated more criticism of America's relationship with Israel, or at least it's, it's more uncritical support uh, of Israel, than you had seen in a long time. And, and I think that's another sense in which 
uh, Lebanon was kind of a setback for Israel? Because I, th I think it has changed the rhetorical tenor a little bit in America. It's a setback for Israel because it causes us to support the war unquestioningly in their self-defeating approach to terror. Well, no, I mean, they, the people running Israel right now, would define this as a setback. I don't think it's a setback. I think, you know, the sooner we get clear on how important it is... Oh, wait, how would they define it as a setback? Well, they would define it as a setback because now the people in America that they define as anti-Israel, that is to say anyone who criticizes the policies of the current Israeli government, right. uh, are emboldened by what happened in Lebanon. There's been more, more criticism of Israel, A, and criticism of uncritical American support of Israel, B, there's been more of that oh, in America than there was before Lebanon. I, I think there's more uncritical acceptance of the equation of Hezbollah's attacks on Israel with al-Qaeda's attacks on America, and it's all one enemy, and now that's, that seems to be accepted by Bush and, and the press uh, much more unquestioningly than before. I'm not sure. I mean, there was this recent thing where the Bush administration kind of made a point of publicly raising the question of whether Israel had violated terms of its agreement with America when it used these cluster bombs. And the speculation was that they had chosen to release this and do this to, to pacify uh, people who were, who were raising doubts about how visibly we had become connected with uh, Israel's response in Lebanon. And if the Bush administration is feeling that kind of heat, okay, that means some of the heat is coming from right of center. And uh, certainly on the left side, I think you saw more vocal criticism of, of Israel than you've, genuinely, than you've generally seen. Now, you may say it was more warranted. It was more obviously warranted. Maybe you're right. I don't know. I, I, I mean, I think basically it's a, yeah. it's, a, it's a split kind of reaction. I think on the, on the right, there is, you're right, they, they buy into it. It's a war. It's Monacan. It's us against them. Uh, on the left, I think uh, there's more murmuring uh, about the wisdom of, of the form that our relationship with Man, Israel has taken. When Israel invaded Lebanon uh, in the 80s, there was a whole lot more criticism of, of that move than there was of the Israeli move into Lebanon recently. Well, that's on the left, with an irrespectable and irrespectable opinion. Yet it blew over. Uh, it, it, you know, I, I remember because because uh, you know Kinsley took a trip to Lebanon at the time, uh, to, you know, as a journalist, and he was criticized by respectable types of how can you how, it took a trip to Israel? How can you do this when Israel is, in, you know, disgracing itself with its invasion of Lebanon? So this is what year? Like eighty two, eighty three, something like that. Yeah, I mean, this is virtually before my. Um, My consciousness of the Middle East. Uh, anyway, well, I, I never knew a whole lot about the Middle East, but uh, but uh, no, I started I paying attention in the late '80s when I went there. Anyway. Um, so that, that's something that surprised me that I was wrong about. Well, you may be right. I certainly think you know that that we need to uh, be much more forceful than we've been in encouraging Israel to uh, to go to great lengths to solve the Palestinian problem once and for all with a negotiated settlement that is acceptable to the Palestinians and. You know, and, and I think the fact that that's not more widely agreed to is, is a sign that, that uh, I guess that I need to say it more often or something. But, but, but that, you know, initially, I mean, you're talking about the reaction to 9-11 uh, on the side of, uh, you know, among Americans who are big supporters of Israel or at least the Israeli government or whatever. And one of the lines then was, this terrorism is not about the Palestinian problem. And it's true that bin Laden didn't care about the Palestinian problem, but it has clearly been a very effective uh, recruiting tool. Um, those well, images. Yeah, but that's the point. Now they've gotten off that line, and now the line is: sure, it's about the Palestinian problem. It's all, you know, it's all one, it's all one uh, terrorist movement, and they're all our enemies. And the U.S. is in the same foxhole as Israel with respect to the Palestinian problem. Well, that's an interesting uh, point. And, they, and, that and, has and, been and, a rhetorical transition. I think that's been the transition. That was a very uh, deaf transition. Uh, I that, congratulate them. Um, um, I mean, our role as triangulator has sort of fallen away, but I may be wrong. Uh, well, that's what I have to say about 9-11. Okay, well, I, I, I think, I, I would only add that, that that piece you directed me to in the, in the Boston Globe by Reza Aslan right. was very good. I, it, I didn't have time to read it. What did it well, say? Well, just speaking of things I didn't understand five years ago, um, one was, uh, he points out, you know, it's commonly said that the Islamic radicals are not just reacting against America, they're also often reacting against their own governments, their own repressive governments. Right. He pointed out that, that to some extent it's also a reaction against clerical authority in the Muslim world that's analogous to the Protestant Reformation, and he even rightly compares, I think, the Internet to the printing press and, and their roles in these two historical developments, although some of the details of the dynamics he describes I might quarrel with. But anyway, I think uh, 
I had never thought of it as, and, and he's saying this is going to be a big, uh, you know, a big, you know, basically you've seen a decentralization of authority thanks to information technology, and so, you know, it's it's the power is largely beyond the hands of the Muslim clerics who have traditionally held power, and a lot of them, of course, are wed to state governments. There's a there's a very close relationship right. between clerical and political authority in a lot of Muslim states. But in any event, he's saying the debate has gone uh, beyond the clerics, and now they're battling it out and. And the way he puts it at the end is now we just have to see whether, you know, moderates like him will win or extremists will win. I mean, what worries me is that there may never be a victory and there may always be just a substantial, uh, you know, a substantial body of opinion on the extremist. Uh, right, even if there's a, even if there's 30 percent support for the extremists, that's enough to sustain. Right, I, I mean, the dynamics that he's outlining lead me to think there's no reason to think that anyone will ever win. It could, it could remain decentralized forever right. and kind of divide into, into different sects of opinion and so on. So uh, the, all, the more, all the more reason, though, I would say, to fight the battle at the level of hearts and minds. There, it was a big, the, but it was really, really a very good piece and, and made me think that I uh, do, in fact, need to, need to read his book, uh, what is it, No God But God? No God But God. The, um, the, there, there was a Martin Amos piece that... that, that that I did read most of, and he has this weird line in it uh, where he basically says, the most extreme Islamists want to kill everyone on earth except the most extreme Islamists, but every jihadi sees the need for eliminating all non-Muslims either by conversion or by execution. Is oh, that, I, I is that an ex crazy statement as yeah, I think I it think is? Yeah, I think that's crazy. I mean, there was a, uh, a couple of things. I, we should link to Matt Iglesias' piece about Pape, is it Robert Pape, the University of Chicago guy who does these game theoretical Dunno. things? Anyway, it debunks the idea that everyone is united in seeking a, a, a global caliphate, I think, as I dimly recall the piece. The other thing is this Lawrence Wright piece in The New Yorker. I mean, I can't say I really have my grip on that piece, because I read the first 2,000 words, and then I was rushing to do this thing, and then so I jumped to the last 500, and I still hadn't gotten to the billboard paragraph. I mean, where do they put these things? I where know, where I do they put the billboard paragraph in the I New Yorker find piece? It I couldn't find any. But anyway, but, ask but our readers thing. to send us the billboard paragraph of Laura's Rice piece. <laughs> yeah, we can't find good, it. That's a good contest. Send in. You'll get a book from Mickey and I both if you can find the billboard paragraph in Lawrence Wright's New Yorker piece. Um, but the, uh, the the upshot clearly was that actually is there's a lot of disagreement within the jihadist community, and a lot of the jihadists uh, are are not really all that interested in, a, in America at all, I think, if I, if I correctly scanned it. But anyway, right, yeah, but that, that contradicts the point you made earlier in this dialogue that we've united them all. Well, if you read Lawrence Wright's piece, uh, we haven't. I did, if I said now, we've united them all, I, mean, also, I take it back. We've united a lot of them. There's also and we, some, we've made many of them more anti-American than they were, but these yeah. are the actual terrorist groups. The Lawrence Wright piece is largely about the kind of thinkers behind the groups and the debate right. that goes on among the cerebral jihadists, but of whom point, apparently Bin yeah. Laden is not one. But he points out there's a lot, A, there's a lot of dissatisfaction with, with Al-Qaeda, uh, Al-Qaeda's focus on America, and I think B, he's one of the people who points out that the soft spot that these guys are going to hone in on is Europe, not America. He may say that. But Europe's he's... easier for them to get to, and their, their yeah. Muslim community is more disaffected. That's all true. Yeah. Uh, I uh, think. Um, I think it may be all true. Uh, well. So, do you, you think that's as much 9 11 as anybody really wants to hear about? From us? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm kind of half afraid to ask viewers to send in any email, if they do wade through my epic piece from four years ago, to send in things I was spectacularly wrong about. Because I, I came across some things. But if anybody wants to do that, I might I might take the punishment. Uh, well, good. I think that would be a good thing. It will toughen you up. Um, th th which leads us to the next, if we are going to discuss this New Republic Lee Siegel thing. Well, let's, uh, no, what I, what I said that there's a David Carr article in today's New York Times that basically says, uh, you know, the, the New Republic is coming back under Frank Four, uh, and I think it has. It is very good under Frank Four, and now it's beset by this Lee Siegel scandal, which, which isn't really all that big a scandal. We've talked about it. Uh, Actually, I thought it was a moderate-sized scandal, but it has nothing to do with Frank Four. But in terms of his even sponsor would, is Leon Weasel here. Even you would agree. I, 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 even you would agree that the long-term damage that the Lee Siegel scandal is going to do to the New Republic is minimal, even if it's a genuine scandal. He's been suspended, and he, you know, that's that's that. It's it's nothing like it's not it's nothing like Stephen Glass. Yeah, it's, not, it's but, not, nothing like Ruth Shalit. I mean, it, well, respectively, I, 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 made I things up and plagiarized. 
you, you mentioned Ruth. I mean, her sins were minor compared with Doris Kearns Goodwin. Yeah, Doris Kearns Goodwin is uh, is back on television, and and and, and you know. That's the scandal he's complained about in the past. The fact Doris Kearns Goodwin's rehabilitation. People are, people are still listing Ruth with her minor sins. Uh, well, it was next to it Steve. was serial plagiarism, Mickey. Come on. Of you know little fragments of sentences in the well, in the, fine, in but the she was warned. Cabin. She did it. She was warned. Right. She well, did this, it again. I mean, what do well, you have to do? Well, this leads to the um, this leads to the uh, to the to, to the question I wanted to address, which is the New Republic more scandal written than other magazines, and why? If so, uh, I note that it was not scandal written under Mike Kinsley. True. Uh, and in fact, Mike. Although he's no longer editor at the time the Stephen uh, uh, Glass scandal was beginning to unfold, before it started to unfold, he said to people he knew, I think this guy's making some of this stuff up. Yeah, his BS his if you just read the pieces, it's pretty clear. His BS detector went off yeah. before other BS detectors went off. Um, so that's one possibility, just that they had some good editors and then they got some editors who were less uh, less careful. Uh, the other, other theory is uh, that... Uh, they are not more scandalous than other publications. It's just people notice them more, which I think is mainly true. I mean, at Newsweek, we had people quit for plagiarism, and nobody paid any attention. They were fired. And is that true? They just went away, yeah. And uh, it was a one-day story of that. And at the New Republic, you know, they make movies about it, Shattered Glass. Uh, <laughs> did you see that movie? I did see the movie. I don't it, was, not, it was kind of modestly interesting to me just because I knew the players. It was I didn't see how anyone who wasn't at the New Republic at the time could find that movie interesting. Anyway. But they do. The shocking thing is they do. I don't get it. I know also people who, 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 who know nothing about the New Republic. I thought that was a good movie. Uh, it, so, it, it, you know, it has something going for it. Uh, the Hayden yeah, Christensen yeah, like performance. People, like people who are better looking than the actual people involved, for example. But I don't see that being enough. Anyway. Uh, the... Um, you're saying Hayden Christensen's better I'm looking? I'm not going to name names. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, shouldn't, I shouldn't have said what I said. Uh, but um, I, I, anyway, and also that the New Republic is sort of self-righteous, has been self-righteous uh, in, in its editorials and in its, in its stance. I think it's mainly because the New Republic under Kinsley sort of carried the hopes and dreams of a bunch of Democrats. And uh, so people care about it in a way they wouldn't care about, you know, if... Uh, if National Review were beset by scandal, or if Mother Jones were beset by scandal. Well, my, certainly Mike made it a more prominent magazine than either of those. I mean, it was, a, it was the perfect... I mean, I should be lucky to have gotten in on the tail end of that era. It was just the perfect moment. Mike was the perfect antidote to the Reagan administration, because he wasn't naively well, you, liberal. You, you, you are too young. He was the perfect antidote to the Carter administration first. Well, I missed don't that part. Hey, don't forget say, they endorsed. But, but, but I enjoyed the Reagan bash. They, well, well, this is why I'm in such an old fogey. I know. Uh, he he pioneered Carter bashing. He and Charlie Peters of the Washington Monthly were were were, were vicious Carter bashers. And if you remember, the New Republican endorsed John Anderson in 1980 because they couldn't bring themselves to endorse Jimmy Carter. Uh, and and they, well, were, that, they actually wrote a very persuasive editorial on why they couldn't endorse Jimmy Carter. Yeah. Uh, so, I'm not sure I would have bought into that. Anyway, the Reagan years were great. Uh, I mean, well, not the years themselves, but 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 the New Republic in those years. Yeah. So well, anyway. wait, where, where, so where are we here? Is there a unified theory as to why there 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 seem to be so many scandals? You're, you're saying there are scandals everywhere, and people only notice them. I was, in the offering, Republic? I was offering several theories and 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 saying I don't know how to choose among them. That's what I was doing. Okay. Uh, but I I think it's a it's a combination of uh, self righteousness. Uh, a, a, a couple of uh, inattentive editors, to, to be euphemistic about it. One of whom is no longer with us, so you can speak freely if you'd like to criticize him. He was killed uh, during the Iraq War. I, you know, I, Mike Kelly was was a big defender of Stephen Glass for a long time, but I, I, I sort of don't. And he was he was treated in in the movie much too, uh, too you know, weeks. much too kindly. Mm -hmm. But uh, but he, he was a per, you know, he wasn't the he didn't hire Glass, and I don't I don't I don't. I don't really blame him. He was, well, just it, you know, he was just defending his troops, which he did sort of reflectively. Well, yeah, but I mean, a, lot of it, a lot of it happened on his watch, right? And, and right, but he was an Irish guy reflexively defending oh, well, his men. Oh, he was Irish. You're right. No, no, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I didn't realize it, he was Irish, Mickey. It was he was good, Irish. They were good leadership qualities to defend your troops, and it was just happened that sometimes your troops are completely wrong. I'm sorry. Uh, See, I thought he, he was Scottish. This changes everything. Eventually, he would have, uh, the scales would have fallen from his eyes. 
As it was, it took Chuck Lane to remove them. Chuck Lane was justly the hero of that story. Correct. Maybe we should end this segment by saying our hats are off to Chuck. Okay. Um, let's Unless do that. you have something else you want to say. No, I don't. Um, and then what? We want to do some uh, some viewer email? Uh, I think so. Um, you started, you generated a bunch of it when you when you and Dan Dresner were Right. On. Well, Dan Dresner and I were talking about Paris Hilton, and, t and I was claiming that uh, pointless celebrities were good for social equality because they showed there was an alternative status hierarchy that didn't rely on money or talent or, or meritocracy, uh, and that it was good that people who had absolutely no ranking on any of these uh, hierarchies could be vaulted high on the celebrity meter. Uh, and I asked, but I couldn't think of anybody aside from a Zsa, Zsa Gabor, who's ancient, uh, who in fact made it up the celebrity meter without either money or talent. Uh, and so I asked readers to submit uh, nominations, and we got quite a few of them. Uh, here are some of them. Okay. Uh, Ernest Blofeld says, Pia Zadora, early 80s actress who had a rich husband. That's true, but apparently she was quite a talented singer. So I don't think Pia Zadora She qualifies. wasn't bad looking, and let's face it, with a lot of actresses, I mean, that's the asset, right? They're, 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 they're not terrible actresses, and they're good looking. Yeah, although if you get rid of everybody who's good looking, then we're never going to come up with anybody. But maybe not. Yeah, Zsa Zsa Gabor was no no slouch, I think. In yeah, so Zsa Zsa Gabor was beautiful. So, uh, now, is she or I, her sister the one on Green Acres? Her sister. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Anna Nicole Smith was from a very poor family before becoming famous without any talent. Well, I don't see how you could say Anna Nicole now, Smith. Did she just no marry talent. a really old guy to become famous? No, no, she was famous as a Playboy Playmate long before. Well, that. right, but how many how many Playboy Playmates can you name? But she was a particularly yeah, that's a personal question. No, she was a particularly famous Playmate because she was the spokesmodel for Guess Jeans. Before she married the really old guy. Yes. yes really? Definitely. Definitely. Um, and this is from Linda Comrish. Um and I don't know. I think uh, I think Anna Nicole had had a certain something. So I, I don't, I don't gonna, know about that. I'm going to leave you alone on uh, that one, buddy. If you'd like to elaborate, go ahead. No, I wouldn't. Brett Larimer uh, says uh, Pat Sajak. So well, are, we now, are we now mentioning both the first and the last names of our viewers? or? Oh, should I not do that? Well, our policy had been, you know, first name, last initial, but whatever. Okay, Brett L. There. <laughs> says Pat Sajak. I'll never know. Uh, he's familiarly mediocre, he has decent teeth, and he can presumably read. That's about it for talent. Wait, he named who? Pat Sajak. Wheel of Fortune. Ah, and somebody else which named, brings us to Vanna White. And somebody else named Vanna White. Ah, uh, yes. Who's, who's, who's an even better example. But I, I don't... I, I claim that I, there's a better answer than these celebrity people who just happen to, to, to hook, up, hook onto, uh, you know, hit shows as announcers or wheel or letter turners or, you know, the babe of the show or the guy of the show, like Ed McMahon, as somebody else mentions. Yeah. Uh, and they, they're sort of showbiz luck. That's... It's nice to have that extra, but that's not quite what we're talking about. We're talking about completely absurd, random people who, who you know, aren't in an, an industry where, the, you know. So who people, are these people? Do you these have some people, names? The answer is these people, as several viewers said, are reality show contestants. Uh, ah. They are the people who, who, who in, a, in our society, have been thrust from absolutely nowhere with absolutely nothing going from them. They don't even have to be that good looking, I don't think. Uh, increasingly, uh, they do. Uh, okay, well, there that's you go. That's what changed. Well, that's when I quit watching Survivor is when the contestants became good-looking. Boy, I saw pictures of the current Survivor. They didn't look that beautiful Well, maybe me. there's been a... Well, oh, can you believe... Oh, we'll get into this next time. Anyway, this thing yeah. Can, okay, anyway, Never mind. Yeah. Go ahead. Anyway, uh, Jacob K. and Marcus T. both suggest reality show celebs, and I think that's the right answer. They're so so reality shows have increased social equality in America. I, I think the general celebrity machine and the way it's been decentralized and plucks people out of totally obscurity and makes them famous has improved social equality, yes. Oh, that's good. That would be my contention. That's a good thing. Uh, yes. And, and, you know, I, you know, yeah, American Idol. But what, is, now wait, but is there, but see, American Idol, you have to define your reality genre. American Idol has made the system in a way more efficiently meritocratic, arguably. Right. Because yes, it, but, and that's not what they're you looking want. For, you, want, you want a lottery-like determination of success, that's, right? That's not a reality show. They're looking for talent. A reality show is when, you know, take... Ten ordinary people and put them in a room with a bunch of snakes or something. Yeah, uh, you know that that sort of thing. Or, or you, you know, you, you go into the uh, New York Daily News and look at Lo Lloyd Groves' assistants, and suddenly you become 
you know, you, you go from Lloyd Rose assistance to be to being the heartthrob of America. Yeah. Uh, so um, that that's what I would be talking about. People who are famous not for being famous, but famous for being not famous, and then become famous. So the, the more random the determinants of success in America, the, the, happy, the happier you are about well, the it's a, country. It's a Michael Walter point. The more different status and hierarchy, status ladders. But at some point, don't you start paying a price in, in terms of sheer efficiency if there's like no, no meritocracy involved at all? Well, sure, if the, if the core guts of the economy are determined on a non meritocratic basis. That would be but bad. you're saying celebrity is is uh, is a special realm to begin with, where it's it's all it's an arbitrary kind of. Well, the more different coins of the realm there are, that people would want the, you know, and the and the, and the more different bases on which those coins are distributed, the better for social equality. I'm with you. But uh, but money, you know, being uh, deriving from the economy should sort of be based on how much you contribute to the economy. But money doesn't buy everything. It doesn't buy celebrity, it doesn't buy looks, it doesn't buy respect, blah, 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 blah. That, that would be the as good as you can get social equality-wise. Um, and Mike uh, Kinsley used to be fascinated with people who he said were famous for being famous. And that's a different category. Right? I mean, that's always that's actually what? long been my aspiration, to, to be someone who's famous for being famous. What? But it seems to me to harness that dynamic, you have to find a way to become famous in the first place. It's, a, sli I can't it's do a slightly different category, although that is what was said about Jaja Gabor. I believe she was the person it was said about. Well, so. also, there used to be on some of these people who would show up on game shows, like, what's my line? I mean, I guess all of them had a reason. Like, it turns out Bennett Surf was head of Random House. Maybe all of them had yeah. stories like that, but... It turns out or Orson Bean was always on those shows. Yeah, what was he famous for? He, he had been an actor or something? He's a, he's a, he was a comic, and uh, he actually, I've actually read into him. He's um, He was funny. He's still funny. Yeah. And he looks like he's like 50 years old. It's unbelievable. And um, and he acted in, he was in, you know, uh, the John Malkovich movie, Being John Malkovich. Was he? He was the guy on the third and a half floor. So he's an actor. So he, he he's not a nobody. <laughs> you brought him up. <laughs> I didn't say anything about him at all. Uh, but um, but you, he's a, he's one of those game show people. We got a great email. I thought the best email we've gotten. Who said uh, they like the Dresner Kaus? This is from David G. They like the Dresner Kaus dialogue. Best of all, I didn't have to endure that insufferably tedious Bob Wright and hear him complain. You know, we get a certain number of emails. More Kaus, less Wright. We get a certain number of emails along those lines, and I like to attribute it to the fact that you use your high traffic blog Kaus files to steer. Your fans to our site, and I don't have a comparably effective tool to use. So I'm just assuming that there's this bias built into the email. I mean, if if that if I couldn't convince myself of that, I think I might have to seek therapy or something because it, it would. You're like, uh, so people complain about you whining too much, and 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 your response is to whine about how you don't have a blog. I think your response would be uh, to say, well, we get all sorts of emails saying more right, less cows, and I don't, I have the good grace not to read them on the air. Yeah, that too. <laughs> no, actually, you know, my experience is that the main time we get pro-right mail on balance is when you say something even more egregiously ridiculous than is your habit, like when you're in one of your pro and Coulter jags. Then the balance tips in my favor, but, like, that's what it takes. I mean, it's like you have to, like, embrace the Antichrist before we start getting any pro-Bob well, mail. They have to overcome the, you know... The inherent unappealing nature of your personality, Bob. I guess no, it's there. true. It's been very sobering. <laughs> I, 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 I thought I was a likable person a year ago, but I can I can live with this. Um, I think uh, Bob. I think you're very likable. Don't, oh, don't be shucks, down, Mickey. It's nice of you to say that. Don't be down. No wonder people like you. I'm a nurturing person. Um, so that's what I had. That's the viewer email I had. I and I think uh, reality shows are the answer. Okay. Well, I had I had a little email, but you know we've probably gone gone on about long enough. It's always good to have some uh, in store. Yeah. Next next time we could divide along ethnic lines, like Survivor. like they're doing in Survivor. Can you yeah. believe that? I mean, do you do you agree that that's kind of a bad idea? It's a terrible idea. Although excellent, you know, at some point when the world is much more enlightened than it is, it'll be fine. But we're not ready for it yet. Quite so. I um, mean. Don't get me started. Okay. Not this not this, not this time. Anymore. Okay. Cool. So well happy Roto Rooter Day. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, hope it's hope it's as good for you as it was for me. <laughs> let's let's talk offline, okay? <laughs> okay. See ya. Okay. See you around.